Thank you for joining me, everyone. For those who don't know me yet, I am Ron Levine from Mindfulness in Blue Jeans, and I stumbled ass backwards into mindfulness and insight meditation almost 25 years ago during a time when I was suffering from clinical anxiety, depression, panic disorder, uh, which had blown up into agoraphobia. So I was unable to work, unable to leave the house. I was on short-term disability, couldn't go past my front door without melting down. And was fortunate enough to get paired up with a psychologist who even back in 1998 was already several decades deep into practicing and teaching mindfulness and insight meditation. And he offered me these tools as a way of working with the issues that I was having. I was not thrilled with his suggestion. My feeling was, look, I can't work. I can't live. I can't go out of the house. And here's this guy saying to me, hey, why don't we sit and watch the breathing for a while? Okay, great. Thanks, I guess. He didn't give me anything else, and I was sitting at home all day anyway, riddled with anxiety. So I figured, okay, I'm going to try this just long enough so I can honestly go back to him and say, look, this didn't work. Can I have the real treatment now? And like I say, this was almost 25 years ago. I have not had that conversation with him yet. And here I am still practicing still doing this, and now teaching sessions like these, and seeing clients of my own. So it might work. At least it seems to so far. I'm going to keep doing it. So here we are. Just so happens, a number of years ago, I was at a one-day retreat being led by this same psychologist. And one of the things that he said during this retreat, in the course of answering some question, he said this phrase, We are that which we seek. And a couple of minutes later, young woman in the front row raises her hand and says, that thing you said a minute ago, we are that which we seek? What does that mean? And he smiled at her and he said, I wouldn't do you the disservice of not allowing you to work that out for yourself. One might reasonably argue that I'm about to provide that exact disservice to you all right now. But I don't really see it that way because I'm going to offer a couple of interpretations that I have of that phrase. And who's to say if they're right or not? Maybe right for me, maybe not right for somebody else. Just ideas that I've had that I thought, hey, why don't we toss these around and see what people think, right? So we are that which we seek. I have two conclusions that I've come to around this phrase. The first one is one that I think of as the personal universe conclusion. And this is what I mean by that. If you think about any given moment in our lives, this one right now, we are experiencing countless sensations, both from our internal system, as well as what we might be experiencing coming in from the outside through our senses. Tons and tons of sensation, more than we could possibly keep track of. So our brains are, as well as they can, trying to filter out what they figure, hey, we don't, we don't have to pay attention to that. That's not critical right now. So we're receiving a subset of all of the sensations that are coming in right now. And of those filtered sensations that we're receiving we are experiencing perception. How we are perceiving just those sensations that are making their way to some level of consciousness. And from there, we are interpreting those perceptions based on previous experience, based on whatever feelings we might be bringing to those perceptions based on perhaps what we were feeling a moment earlier. And those are, in turn, creating new feelings about what we have just interpreted, about what we have just perceived. From these feelings are coming thoughts, concepts, memories, judgments, based on our past experience, based on how we take all these things in. Just to give a couple of quick examples of what I mean here, An example of differing perceptions or interpretations, 
I remember a few years ago, I found out this really fascinating thing. And if you want to get deep into the science of it, I'm not your guy. You'll have to look it up elsewhere. You know, use your Googles or whatever. But I remember finding out a few years ago that color, color is just vibration. So when we see green grass outside, when we see a blue sky, those are vibrations that we are perceiving as color. And each of us, because we have different sense organs, different bodies, different experiences, different vantage points, we're all seeing slightly different variations of what we are interpreting as green or blue or what have you, aren't we? And if we take that to a higher conceptual level, to the level of thought patterns, of concepts, think about how an overgrown lawn looks to different recipients. A child might see a playground. A landscaper would see a day's work. A cow would see lunch. Who's right? How many lawns are there? What's my point? My point is, we are not passive recipients of our experience. We have an agenda, don't we? What's our agenda? What's always our bottom line agenda? We seek to experience and maintain pleasant feelings. And we try to stop and prevent unpleasant feelings. Basically what it all comes down to, isn't it? That's the hamster wheel we're always on, running towards the pleasant, away from the unpleasant. But here's the thing. Those feelings don't come from the external objects. Those feelings come from our inner interpretation of them. For example, let's go back to that landscaper looking at that overgrown lawn. How does he feel about it? Well, how he feels about it, being a day's work, is going to depend on whether or not he needs the money, right? What if you tell him, oh yeah, there's an overgrown lawn here. We don't need you to take care of it. Well, if he needs the money, he's not going to be real happy about that. On the other hand, if he doesn't need the money and you say, yeah, you don't have to worry about that, but here's a chair and some beers if you want to just go hang out on it. Oh, okay. Right? has nothing to do with the lawn any more than whether the lawn is a day's work, a playground, or lunch. It's what we're bringing to it. So we have within us, regardless of the external circumstances, the capacity to experience every pleasant feeling we want to, don't we? Because that's coming from us. That's inside. Even if you want to take it to, you know, the biological level and say, well, we have the neurotransmitters that can, you know, it's within. The capacity for every feeling, including all the ones that we strive to generate and keep, is within us. In that way, in that sense, we are rather literally that which we seek. If we are seeking certain kinds of feelings, which we kind of always are, right? And the capacity to have all of those feelings is already within us. Well, we are that which we seek, aren't we? What are we looking outside for? Then we're depending on the outside to give us or allow us to feel what we already have the capacity to feel. How's that working out? All right? So that's my first conclusion about we are that which we seek. In a way, it's the more optimistic of the two, but it's actually the second one that I find much more intriguing because... There's more we can do with it. There's real opportunity for action. 
And it builds upon the first one. So where the first one was sort of this personal universe conclusion, this one comes to the identification with that universe. Okay? So if we go back, like I was saying a moment ago, we've got all of these sensations that are being filtered. And we've got these perceptions of those sensations, our interpretations of them, the concepts and the feelings, the thought patterns, all these things that arise. And it's not obviously a linear process. They all interweave. They all bounce off of each other and affect each other. It's kind of a microcosm of karma, if you will. The Buddhist sense of karma, like I always say, not the bastardized Western sense of karma where it's about justice and revenge and what goes around comes around. Actual karma in its original sense, cause and effect, interrelated causes and effects. It's a little microcosm of causes and effects, the sensations and the perceptions and the memories and the emotions, all these things that get generated, they affect each other. How we feel about something happens within the context of how we were feeling a moment earlier. All of these have a way of coalescing around some kind of desire. Like I was saying, we want those pleasant feelings. We want to not experience the unpleasant feelings. And what does this conglomeration of processes lead to? Well, they lead to a sense of self sense of self, because we identify with those desires. Because if you think about it, if there's wanting, well, geez, there's wanting. Who's wanting? I must be wanting. Somebody's wanting. It must be me. So who wants? I want. And then what happens when we get that thing that we want? Well, who got that? I got that. It's mine. It's mine. And then what happens? Well, I remember back in my psychology days, we learned about how we have this especially strong aversion to loss. There are these really interesting studies out there about how we are more averse to losing something that we have than we are to not getting something that we want. We have this special aversion to loss, which really strengthens that identification with mine, right? Because right. not only, okay, that's mine, but you damn well better not try to take it from me. All right. That becomes something we have. And if we combine that with what I was talking about a moment ago about this desire that comes up or what's often re referred to in Buddhism as attachment, clinging, sometimes feeding, which is a very strong metaphor. Sometimes not a metaphor, sometimes literally, right? Feeding. We tend to think that we have this attachment, this desire, this clinging to these things. This thing I want, this thing that I have. We don't. Not when we really look at it. The attachment is actually for the internal feelings that we have associated with these external objects. So it's not so much... Who wants this? I want this. It's more, I want that because of how I think I'll feel if I get it. I want that feeling. And I think that thing is going to give it to me. And if we get it, then I want to keep that because of how I think I'll feel if I lose it. That's behind probably every conflict that's ever happened in the history of the human species, right? So our identification with these desires, these needs, these requirements becomes this sense of self. 
I am a person who needs to have that thing, needs to be in a relationship with that person, needs to exhibit this character trait, needs to be seen as being this certain way by other people in order to be happy, or at least okay. The way that I've thought about it a lot over the years for myself is I picture this metallic sculpture that I've been building and tinkering with, bolting things onto since my earliest days. And okay, every time I want a new thing, okay, I'm a person who wants it and you just kind of grab another hunk of metal and just bolt the thing onto there, bang it on there, get it and over the years and the decades, this big monstrosity, this jagged, weird ass looking metallic monstrosity just keeps growing and growing and some parts have started to rust over the years and I have to go back and polish it and I got to make sure myself is nice and clean people are going to see this right you know as you find something else you want you, you bolt it on this is one of my wants and then maybe you get it and it's like oh, okay I can upgrade that piece now it went from a want to a have so let me upgrade that to you know okay great that now I have that don't take that piece that's mine that's mine <laughs> don't touch that you can look, look, but don't touch, right? So this big self-concept that is based upon what? What we seek. Based upon what we seek. So then somebody says, well, tell me about yourself. Oh, sure. Here's my sculpture. And what is it? All the things I seek. That's myself. We are that which we seek. When we identify with what we seek, we define ourselves by it. And when we spend our lives always running after what we're seeking or running from what we don't want, which is just the flip of seeking. We spend our whole lives doing that blindly. And then we define ourselves based on that blind running. Well, guess what? We are that which we seek. And like I say, it doesn't sound quite as optimistic as the first conclusion, does it? But it's my preferred one. Because it points to, oh, okay, well, what did the Buddha teach? How to stop our suffering. And what does this conclusion show? How to stop our suffering. So I like the first conclusion, but I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. It just kind of, to me, it just kind of is. It just kind of, it, it's, it's something to watch. It's something to observe. It's something to learn from. But it's this second one where I'm like, ah, oh, okay, yeah. So <laughs> here's where I'm getting in my own way. I can't affect so much the sensations and perceptions that come in and, you know, the interpretations. Are this, is, this is autonomic stuff. I can't directly reach in and necessarily change that. Indirectly over time, those things have a way of getting altered in better ways by virtue of working with these things in the second conclusion. These things I can directly work on. And that's what I want to get into in today's sitting is go through a few things that can help maybe shed a light on where some of these things are arising. That's always really the first step is that clear seeing of what's actually happening here so that we can discern where we focus our attention and energy. Because it's rarely about the amount of energy we put out. It's really about focusing it skillfully, applying it in the right place, using the right leverage so that we get good effects. Again, karma, the cause and effect, right? Why don't we jump into a little sitting? The first cue that I always like to give when we are starting a sitting is to have your hips elevated higher than your knees if you are able to. It's good for your breathing as well as your posture. And if that's something that's not possible right now, that's not a big deal. Something to keep in mind for next time, perhaps. And I always like to begin by imagining that I am suspended from the ceiling. 
by a string attached to the top of my head. As a nice cue to sit up straight without adding tension to do so. And if you find that there is some tension in the body right now, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. There's no need to try to eradicate your tension if you have some. That really just adds tension to the tension that's already there and is an example of one of those ways that we get in our own way. If you are experiencing some tension, let it be tension. Let it do what it needs to do. It will leave in its own time. Maybe today. Maybe not. At the opposite end, at our base, I like to notice what's in contact with the chair, the floor. So we have a sense of grounding. We're being supported by something, and we can allow it to support us. So let's just take a moment and notice that feeling of support at the bottom, and the gentle lift at the top, and whatever else happens to be in between the two. And if you haven't already, you may begin to start bringing your attention to your breathing. And you may notice as soon as you do that, that your breathing may change. It's usually pretty difficult to bring our attention to our breathing and not have it change in some way. Notice that in this practice, we don't need to change the breathing from the way that it is. In this practice, our meditative breath is simply the breath that we are watching while we meditate. We may have a desire, a desire to have a good meditation session. I want to be a good meditator. I want to get this. I want to get that. I want to do it right. And we may think, okay, so I have to breathe long, deep, contemplative, you know. No. What we're doing right now is seeing whatever desires, storylines, requirements, we might happen to have about this practice, about this breathing that's happening. I'm a person who needs to breathe like this and have a meditation. Okay. Do you really need that though? Is that helping? Can we just watch the breathing that's happening without interfering? Who are we then? What if instead of I have to breathe like this or I'm breathing like that, what if it's just here's breathing? 
The body can breathe on its own. It doesn't need us. There is breathing. Perhaps you've been controlling your breathing for a number of years. You're not sure how to stop. I was like that for a very long time. Okay. Don't try too hard to stop the control. That's just controlling, controlling. So watch the controlling. Let it be controlling. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Watch it. Let's take a few minutes and watch whatever processes are coming up around your breathing. The breathing process itself, any feelings about it, positive or negative, any interference with it, any feelings about the interference with it. Can we watch more, do less? As we sit, go through this process of making space for things to arise, things have a way of arising, usually thinking. And what gives rise to the thinking? What gives direction to the thought? Eh, usually some form of desire, right? Desire, aversion, the things we've been talking about. Notice that process. If a thought arises, what's driving that? And we don't have to follow it all the way down the rabbit hole. That's not what we're here to do. We notice, okay, here came a thought. And, oh, here's a felt sense with it. Maybe some kind of desire, some kind of aversion. A wanting, a fearing, some such. Oh, okay. There it is. Saw that. Okay. And we come back to the breathing. And maybe there's also a secondary thought about the thought or a feeling about the thought. I once heard that emotions are just thoughts with a felt sense. So perhaps you have a thought and then right after it, you have a thought or a feeling about it saying, oh, I'm supposed to be meditating and I'm supposed to have a clear mind and I'm not supposed to be thinking. Okay. Guess what? That's just another thought. 
and we catch that. No difference. Just another storyline. It's just a storyline about the storylines, that's all. We catch that one. Oh, okay. This was another thought that arose out of a desire to be a good meditator, and okay, that whole line of happy horseshit, right? Okay, I see it now. And there is breathing. I often say that mindfulness and insight meditation will give you everything if you ask nothing of them. Which kind of gets back to that identification with desire, right? If we have a requirement for our practice... then we're not really allowing our practice to unfold naturally, are we? It's an interference. And then we decide afterwards how good or bad our practice was based on <laughs> how well we interfered with it, right? When we decide where our practice must go, we take off the table where our practice could go. Now, in alternate sort of way, I've also heard that same sentiment described as practice mindfulness without an agenda, including the agenda of being mindful. Now, can we really do that? I don't know. I mean, we always have an agenda somewhere, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're doing this for a reason, right? There's intent here. So the point isn't necessarily to try to stamp out our agenda. It's more a matter of giving us a way to uncover that agenda. Get some of that clear seeing around it. Not in the interest of utterly eradicating it, killing it, stamping it out. But simply so that we are not being blindly driven by it. We don't have to blow up the hamster wheel. We get the same effect by just sitting next to it. Either way, at least we're not on it, right? But we have to know that we're on it. 
in order to get off of it. That's really what this process is. Getting the real lay of the land. Oh, okay. This is what's actually happening. This is how I'm actually living. This is what I'm bringing to the process. This is how I'm perpetuating. I'm perpetuating my suffering. We may be feeling some pain. We don't have a choice about that. There may be pain. There may be discomfort, those things that we can't control. But we can control how we work with those things. And that determines whether or not we experience suffering. But we're going to have to see clearly our role in that suffering first. And where do we start? There is breathing. You might choose to focus on one aspect of your experience. I was talking about sensations and perceptions and interpretations and thoughts and feelings and concepts. We could just look at sensation. What if we just breathe with whatever sensation is coming up? And as we build our skill with just doing that, we begin to see how the rest of the process unfolds. Oh, geez, every time I feel this sensation, I suddenly get that thought. I get that feeling. Look at this reaction that just happens. Well, why does it happen? Well, because I've been reacting that way for decades. Is it helping? Oh, geez, no, it's not. Oh, what should we do about that? Well, let's find out a little bit more, huh? There's a lot more undoing in this practice than doing. I've certainly found over the years. There's not a lot to do. It's a hell of a lot to undo. If you're experiencing some kind of physical pain or discomfort, you might just notice that. The sensation, perception, interpretation, thoughts, feelings, storylines, how it affects the breathing, and vice versa. Again, these are all interrelated processes, it's not linear. So what's the good news there? Well, if you make a change in one spot, it affects all the others, doesn't it? You don't have to change every piece of the cycle to get it going in the opposite direction. The Buddha himself taught about multiple entry points into this practice and numerous aspects of dependent core arising. And it can be overwhelming 
<laughs> believe me, it can be overwhelming to study these at times because there's just so much. At least I, I find it overwhelming sometimes. But the Buddha himself said, look, you don't have to change every one of these aspects to make your way to the other side. They're all interrelated. You can take just this one and that'll be enough. The effect cascades around the others. That's why the breathing can be enough. There is breathing. As we wrap up the sitting, I'll leave you with a thought that I came up with a number of years ago, as well as a question to take with you and perhaps reflect on later on off the cushion and on the cushion. Along the lines of the sense of self, something that I wrote a number of years ago that I'd like to share is we define our present selves by our own imperfect recollections of our own incomplete interpretations of our past thoughts, feelings, and experiences. I'll say again. We define our present selves by our own imperfect recollections of our own incomplete interpretations of our past thoughts, feelings, and experiences. And along those lines, this is the question that I will offer for some additional reflection. Who are we? without our desires, our requirements for happiness. Who are we if we approach things with a beginner's mind instead of dragging our sculpture, our concept of self along behind us? Who are we then? If we're not that which we seek, what are we?
I think we can open it up for some discussion, a little Q&A. Hi, Kainan. How's it going, man? Yeah, hey, Ron. How's it going? Good. Good to see you, my friend. Yeah, good to be here. It's always great. You know, I take a lot away from all your sessions. Cheers, man. The topic reminded me of a um, scene from a TV show. Um, it's called That 70s Show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so... It was when Red was uh, going with his wife to a function, and one of his wife's coworkers asked him, "So, what do you do?" He says, "About what?" You know. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really funny, very appropriate for this topic. Like he doesn't have to prove himself in any way, you know. Uh, so I thought that was funny and appropriate. That's fantastic. That's exactly it, right? There's this default assumption about, you know, what do you do? Well, I'm asking about you know, your your work in this case. You're defining yourself by your work. And obviously, I was talking about defining ourselves by our desires. Many different ways that we define ourselves, not just by our desires. But that was just germane to the, the topic of what we seek. But certainly, the job one's another big one. A lot of people develop issues around, oh, I've just lost my job. Who am I? You know, suddenly this identity crisis, and it's the same sort of thing. Anytime we choose to identify ourselves with either something external or even something internal in the case of like an ephemeral process, if we identify with a feeling, well, feelings aren't permanent. Even when they're here, they're changing. So anytime we start to identify with something and say, that's myself, uh, there's trouble there. That's not sustainable. <laughs> so yeah, that that's a really outstanding example and a, a funny one. That's and Red Foreman is yeah, I mean, amazing character. So that's I, I love that that style of humor that really just cuts right to the. You know, like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, well, right. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Thank you. Cheers, man. Good to see you again. Hey, Mike. I just wanted to share what I kind of saw as when I was thinking about this question during the week, you know, the, the title and thinking what it meant to me. And, and I really enjoyed your talk. Um, and the, the second, I had a slight different interpretation originally. Yeah, please. Um, I've heard the phrase that a lot of suffering stems from just simply not accepting that things, that things are different than way you want them to be. Right. Um, and then I thought, well, uh, if you find acceptance then, and things get better, and if you start with accepting yourself, you realize, well, I'm already there. Everything I am, I don't need to seek anything, right? There's, because I, it is, because I've already accepted I am what I am. Um, and you may work on changing certain aspects, but you, at any given moment, you are exactly who you are. And with just by having that acceptance, is the 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 seeking goes away, in 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 a form in a way. That that was kind of my thought when I first read the title. That was it. I'm just going to share that thought. Cheers, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. And if anyone else has any thoughts about their own interpretations, please feel free to share them. Like I said at the beginning, I'm not decreeing that mine are the ones. But yeah, what you're saying really gets to the point of what I've sometimes heard described as I need to be over there to be happy. Let's say you get there. Okay, are we happy? No, we looked at the next spot. Now I need to get over there. I mean, it just perpetuates. It perpetuates. What I have found is it is possible in this realm of acceptance because what I'm about to say doesn't sound logical, but this isn't always logical, is it? And that's part of what drives most of us crazy about it, including me, because I'm very left-brained and logical. But I have found, as illogical as it sounds, that it is possible to simultaneously accept where we are in the practice while also accepting that there's more to be done. On paper, they sound mutually exclusive, and my logical brain breaks over the fact that I'm able to simultaneously hold these two acceptances, but I can. 
it's really interesting. That's why logic will never carry us. Logic by itself, I should say. Logic is necessary, but it's not sufficient to bring us to the other side. It's one of my biggest challenges in this practice is like, okay, left brain's got to take a back seat for a while. <laughs> it's it can't it can't get me all the way there because I'm used to using the left brain to get me all the way there. Not not in this case, it doesn't work. So, yeah, acceptance is a funny thing like that I found is yeah, there can be an acceptance. And I say this in the hopes that it will perhaps help others or maybe resonate with others, maybe open a perspective for other people that yeah, you know what? I found you can accept where you are as well as accept that there's more to be done at the same time. Along those lines, I just wanted to share this because it's along the lines of acceptance and happens to be something that I read recently because acceptance is a real tricky topic. I have a whole shtick on acceptance that obviously I won't get into here, but a lot of you know that I read a lot of work from Tanisaru Bhikkhu. And I'll give Gary a shout out right now because I know he reads some of the same sites that I do. And those of you who follow me on Insight Timer and on the Mindfulness and Blue Jeans circle on Insight Timer, Gary's been sharing a lot of stuff from Tanis Arubiku on there lately. Thank you, Gary. Keep that up. I love it. Tanis Arubiku is a, an American monk who is just – all of his work is free, available online and in print. It's all free. And he, to me, is probably the closest thing to a living, breathing – instance of the historical Buddha we have on this mud ball right now. His work is incredibly detailed and comprehensive, which is why I was saying during the sitting, studying some, when I was saying some of this stuff gets overwhelming to study, he's the guy I'm talking about. I read something from him recently that I found really interesting around acceptance. And it was something to the effect of acceptance doesn't just mean we lay back and just accept any old thing that happens because it's happening and we have to accept it because it's happening. Acceptance can be the acceptance, the acknowledgement of, hey, I have a role in how I am. Like I said, we're not passive recipients of our, of our experience. So there's this acceptance that I have a role in this, an active role in this. Whether I'm aware of it or not, I'm engaging in this process. And if I'm engaging in this process in a way that I am not aware of, well, how's that going to work out for me? About as well as driving a car without realizing you're driving a car. So if we're going to be engaging in our experience either way, blindly or with clear seeing, we might as well do it with the clear seeing. So in this case, the acceptance isn't just, oh, I accept I'm blindly engaging in this process because that's just the way it is and I have to accept it and harmony and beauty and flowers and meditation and love and okay, okay, good luck with that. An acceptance of, oh, I have a role in this and I may not be seeing it clearly or I may not be seeing all of it clearly. And if I accept that, if I acknowledge that, well, guess what? Now I can take some action. Now I can engage in karma, cause and effect skillfully. I now have a place. Okay. Like I said before, it's not just the amount of energy we're putting forward. It's where we're applying it. We can put out all kinds of energy blindly and good luck. But if we put out a small amount of energy with clear seeing, well, holy shit. Now things are moving. Now things are moving, right? Cheers, man. I, I've also heard the term that I thought was relevant to that is that acceptance is not submission. Mm, nice one. Right, yeah. That's, yeah. I, that one I have not heard before. That might be the, the, the shortest description or, or description of what acceptance is not. And for those who want to hear my whole shtick on it, if you go to the YouTube channel or the Patreon or Insight Time or any of the places, I have a session called Unlocking Acceptance. And that's where I really get into the whole acceptance bit because I found that when people talk about acceptance, it's not very helpful because there's not really, again, this karma. There's not this action. There's not really a plan around how to, oh, just accept it. Uh, okay. And then we just try to deny it. Oh, okay, I've accepted it. It doesn't bother me anymore. Okay. If you're interested in my thing on acceptance, you can look for unlocking acceptance. And I get more into how I worked with it a number of years ago with something very difficult that was a little bit more of what I found to be a more effective action plan for real 
genuine acceptance if anyone wants to check that out cheers man gary yeah um i think the thing i put in the the uh, inside timer chat this morning is right on to what your theme was today is that there's nothing we can do about old karma it, it, it's our old memory retentive memories coming up and shading our point of view however we can acknowledge it through awareness and begin new karmas to replace that to kind of push it aside so there's always an opportunity then for growth so i i, I thought that you know i've been reading this stuff that uh, thanks to you and uh, it's uh it's tremendous yeah absolutely and it's kind of a funny thing isn't it is we can fall into that trap and i think that was one of the traps that was in what you posted today was was saying we can fall into the trap of this sort of not even necessarily submiss along the lines of submissiveness sub <laughs> submissiveness easy for me to say but almost this sense of resignation of like oh well i've got all this bad karma i'm screwed anyway and it's like, eh, well, that in itself is a reaction or a response that is then perpetuating that karma. Are you actually screwed? No, you're screwed to the extent of how you then deal with when those old karmas arise, depending on how you deal with them. And you can only do that in the present moment. The way I've thought of it over the years, the, the, the karma, I've described it a few times like this, is I picture one of those really old school video games, because that was the last time I played video games is when, you know, the old school video games, I'm talking like, you know, the, the really old stuff where you're just kind of you're going down a screen. And it's like, I, I picture like a really horribly rendered character who's going down this desert and there's rock like mountains boulders on either side and that's where you can't walk so you're kind of just trapped going and i think of the boulders or the mountains on the sides as being karmic restriction like here's what here's what you're restricted to by your past karma and this is the area you can kind of walk within and yet you can't affect the way that the mountains are there now because they're already there and they're there based on what you did previously but depending on what you do now will affect the pattern of mountains going forward. So if you continue to try to bang up against the mountains and get frustrated about it, well, yeah, they're going to shrink inward and inward and inward and your path is going to get ever narrower. But if you just kind of, oh, all right, let me work with this as it is and here's this, it is, here's this then it's going to have a chance to start to spread out because you're not compounding it. And that's the way I've pictured it is, okay, what do I do now to set the conditions for better effects going forward? And yeah, if you do that, yeah, you're not so screwed. You're not so screwed. Yeah, exactly it. Cheers, man. Oh, and thank you, Carol. Carol just put a shout out for the uh, unlocking acceptance session in the chat. Thank you, Carol. Cheers. Hi, Chloe. So, yeah, there's something a little bit struggling with lately, and that's I'm noticing sometimes when I wake up in the middle of the night, you know, my mind is churning and I don't want it to churn. And wondering, like, what is it about? thinking that I love so much like why am I attached to thinking so like one of the things I came up with is I want to problem solve so then I'll be more comfortable so but my desire to lessen these cravings is that a craving unto itself this is one of those times when I'll say we may need to take some of this offline <laughs> because it's it's a deep topic, but it's a fantastic question. First off, I love that you asked yourself why this craving, this attachment to thinking. And I love what you've come up with so far. You probably saw some of my footsteps on that exact path. That is one of the things I have noticed again and again and again is I have, and I know I'm not unique in this, what I term an addiction to thinking. 
like I say, left brained, always trying to use thought for the same thing, problem solving, feel better, feel comfortable, things going to be okay, yada, yada, yada. I'm going to put this briefly because it's a, it's a huge topic. But what you're asking about is, is that a form of craving? It is. But it is a more, I'm trying to choose my words carefully here. It is in some sense, a more skillful craving. Because you are noticing it with clearer seeing, as well as ex you're experiencing a desire to set the conditions to decrease your own suffering, ultimately. The reason I say it's an enormous topic is the monk I mentioned earlier, Tanasaro Bhikkhu. He has an entire book dedicated to exactly what you just asked. It's called The Paradox of Becoming. It is a very dense read. I'm not saying don't read it. I'm just saying be forewarned. It's a very dense read. It's not Buddhism 101. <laughs> and the, the upshot is that there are three kinds of craving. There's craving for sensuality. There's like sensual craving. There's craving for becoming with becoming being the identification with the things I was talking about earlier in my second conclusion, we essentially become what he calls worlds. We inhabit these worlds that we create for ourselves based on our identities. I'm this person in this world and this person in this world, whether it's a father or an employee or a person who wants to have that car or whatever, we inhabit these different, this is becoming this birth. But then there's a third kind of craving. And it's a craving for non-becoming. Which is exactly what you're talking about. The craving to stop the craving. And this is the paradox of becoming. If we're craving non-craving, then we are still craving. That's the paradox of becoming. The way out of that is this practice, this observation of how these processes are unfolding. In a way, this actually ties in with the unlocking acceptance session. One of the things that I say in there is that we cannot achieve acceptance by trying to achieve acceptance. Because if we're trying to achieve acceptance, then we are not accepting the resistance we have to the acceptance itself. If we're not even going to accept the resistance we have to the acceptance, how the hell are we going to get to actual acceptance? So if we are craving non-craving, we've just cut our legs out from under us in a sense. So what do we do? Well, we direct our attention elsewhere. Like I've said a few times now, it's not the amount of energy we're putting forth, it's where we're directing it. So in this case, instead of directing our energy towards the craving for non-craving, we direct it towards the process that's giving rise to those cravings themselves, including the craving for non-craving. When we clearly see the processes as they arise and unfold, then they have a chance to process because we're not interfering. When they have a chance to process because we're not interfering, then they have a chance to pass away. And when they've had a chance to pass away, what's there left to crave? That's a very, very oversimplified 20,000 foot view of the way out of the paradox of becoming. But I'll leave that there. <laughs> we can certainly get more into that separately if you'd like to. Feel free to reach out. That is the shortest but most complete answer I think I can give to an outstanding question. Thank you for that. I think I'm going to leave it there. We're coming up on the time. Hopefully we'll see you all again in a couple of weeks. Thank you all so much, everyone. Cheers.